seems to me that Woody Allen had it figured out a long time ago, and it seems that we didn't figure it out, so I'm afraid that we made the wrong choice. People give me this glass half full analogy on a regular basis. I'm not optimistic particularly, I'm not pessimistic, I like to call myself a realist. And that's not necessarily good news. For us and the many other species we're taking with us into the extinction abyss. Bear in mind that we've had no humans on the planet at three and a half degrees centigrade above baseline at any point in the past. The first two million, two million years of the human experience are characterized by temperatures less than three and a half degrees C above baseline. Baseline meaning the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. I think we're headed for human extinction not because we aren't clever and adaptable, not because we can't adjust to temperature swings that are quite dramatic, but because we'll run out of habitat for our species. As with every other species, the human animal requires habitat as well. And I suspect when we get up to more than three and a half degrees C, we're going to experience a lack of food, primarily. Uh, in some cases, an absence of water. In some cases, other attributes of habitat will be missing. We've had plenty of warnings in the past. George Perkins Marsh, the naturalist and U.S. ambassador, predicted the consequences of burning fossil fuels on the urban heat island effect and also on warming of the planet as early as 1847. Not long after that, about a half a century after that, Arrhenius Fente comes along in 1896 in the Referee Journal literature and predicts that if we keep fo burning fossil fuels, we're going to experience one degree C temperature rise at the level of planet by the year 2000. 104 years in advance, and Arrhenius just about nailed it. He came very close to predicting with great precision what the global average temperature would be. Guy Callender in uh, 1938 demonstrates for the first time the consequences of burning fossil fuels on global average temperature. And you can see in this figure drawn by hand the pronounced increase in, in temperature that occurs in about 1915 and that's about 40 years after the beginning of burning oil and other fossil fuels at scale. So this figure demonstrates the 40-year lag between emissions and temperature rise, and also demonstrates that we, that we crossed the Rubicon in terms of global average temperature quite a long time ago. The, the planet was warming quite a long time ago, and we had the evidence to illustrate that. Frank Capra, the filmmaker, when he was working for GE, made a short film called The Unchained Goddess, in which he demonstrated and predicted a, a rise in global average temperature that would threaten our species with its continued existence. The Unchained Goddess points out that, uh, that global average temperature rise, global warming, or climate change, was a greater threat to the continuation of the human species than even the atomic age itself. This was, this was about the time or shortly after the atomic age began. Ivan Illich, Austrian philosopher in language that's entirely too convoluted, maybe something was lost in translation here. So I'm going to try to translate that back into simpler language. I think what he's saying is industrial civilization is uh, demeaning, it's oppressive, and it will lead to extinction of the human race. Noah comes along, and this last month, as the previous month, as the previous month before that, pointed out that it's been many, many months since we had a monthly average temperature that was below normal. Now you would think, in the absence of a warming planet, that we would experience a below average temperature month about every other month. There's a 50% chance that each month is going to be slightly below average in terms of global temperature. Or a 50% chance it's going to be slightly above average. We haven't had a below average temperature month since February of 1985. When I speak on college campuses, very frequently there's almost nobody in the audience, sometimes nobody in the audience, that has experienced 
what I would call a normal Earth. They've only experienced a warmed Earth. In their entire life, global average temperature on a monthly basis has been above average. Robert Watson, speaking before the Senate Environment Committee, the United States Senate, uh, points out that we are burning fossil fuels and that it actually threatens us with human extinction within a few decades. This is 1986 that he's making this statement, and he actually brings up the notion of human extinction within a few decades, and that was reported widely by the Associated Press. And finally, the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases points out in October of 1990 that if we cross the one degree C Rubicon, if we warm the planet by one degree C, we're going to trigger all kinds of self-reinforcing feedback loops that start to feed upon themselves. I'm going to point out shortly that we've already triggered those at 0.85 C above average. And in fact, it appears that we triggered the first one, the most lethal of them, at about 0.76 degrees, or three quarters of a degree above average in terms of global average temperature. I'm going to take a look at some of the major assessments that have come out within the last seven years or so, starting with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's much vaunted fourth assessment that came out in late 2007, in which they predicted a more than 1.8 C temperature rise by 2100, depending upon the emission scenario, up to a 4.5 degree C temperature increase. Remember that according to the United Nations Envi Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases, Beyond one degree C may elicit rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear responses that would threaten extensive ecosystem damage. So one degree C is truly catastrophic, and we had the warning from the IPCC in their fourth assessment uh, seven years ago, the consequences of, of crossing that one C Rubicon. Hadley Center for Meteorological Research comes along about a year after the IPCC's fourth assessment and predicts about two degrees C by the end of this century. Shortly thereafter, the director of their climate change prediction group for the Hadley Center says it's more likely that we'll experience between 5 and 7 C temperature rise. It's difficult for me to imagine a scenario in which there are any humans on the planet at 5 C above baseline. Again, we've never experienced a planet at 3.5 C above baseline that had habitat for humans. United Nations Environment Program comes along in mid-2009 and predicts 3.5 C by the end of the century. Notice all of the projections are for at the end of the century or uh, some 80 years beyond, 80 plus years beyond where we are right now. Hadley Center for Meteorological Research comes along just a, about a year after the previous assessment and says 4 is the new 2 and it's coming by mid-century. Global Carbon Project and Copenhagen Diagnosis at the time of the COP15 meetings, Conference of Parties meetings in Copenhagen that, that were thrown under the bus primarily by the United States uh, Presidential Administration. And they conclude 6 or 7 C respectively by century's end. United Nations Environment Program comes along again and predicts not 4 C by mid-century, but up to 5 C by 2050, by mid-century. And finally, the U.S. Department of Defense in their quadrennial defense assessment comes out every four years. So in their quadrennial assessment put out, put, it, put, it, put out in 2010, lists climate change among the most dire threats to not our species, not to industrial civilization, but to national defense, which of course is their primary concern. And finally, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in their fifth assessment, the first portion of which was released a little bit early, all of which has been heavily leaked at this point. And in their fifth assessment, the IPCC points out that global warming is irreversible without massive geoengineering of the planet's atmosphere. What does that mean? What does that look like? Let's take a look at some of the notions behind geoengineering. Again, the IPCC in the report already leaked and due out this year. And in fact, uh, a second part of the report is going to be released on Monday, two days from today. And they point out that 
we've, we've hit irreversible climate change in the absence of geoengineering. Then, in a classic case of closing the barn door after the horse has already escaped, we have a series of journal articles that take on the task of analyzing the consequences of geoengineering. The first of those is reported in Earth System Dynamics in December of last year, in which, quote, climate geoengineering cannot simply be used to undo global warming. There's no going back. The horse is already out of the barn, and chasing down the horse and shuttling it back into the barn, it's too late to do that. Journal of Geophysical Research points out the same month geoengineering may succeed in cooling the Earth, but it like will ha likely will have catastrophic impacts that are unforeseen. Environmental research letters, January, so just about two and a half months ago, attempts to reverse the impacts of global warming by injecting reflective particles into the stratosphere could make matters worse. And that's the most common, commonly proposed approach to geoengineering is to put particles into the atmosphere, some kind of, sometimes called solar radiation management, or SRM. Environmental Research Letters, another paper coming out just over a month ago, reports that risk of abrupt and dangerous warming is inherent to large-scale implementation of solar radiation management, of SRM. And so we can put those particles up in, there into the atmosphere, but they point out that it has to be a continuous process. We have to continually put particles into the atmosphere. The moment we stop, particles fall out, and they predict catastrophic and immediate rise in temperature as soon as... SRM, or solar radiation management, ceases. Finally, in Nature Communications from just about a month ago, the risk of, sorry, current schemes, and, and they do an overview of a variety of approaches to geoengineering in that paper. And what they conclude is that current schemes are likely to either be relatively useless or actually make things worse. So implementation of the various geoengineering strategies that have been attempted is likely to have little effect or actually make matters worse. And finally, also from the Referee Journal literature from Nature Climate Change, the public isn't interested. There, there appears to be very little positive response to the notion of geoengineering from the public. So not only does it look like it won't work, but the public is on board with it not working and thinks it's a terrible idea. John Davies, writing for the Arctic Methane Emergency Group in September of last year, this is a great quote, concludes that the world is probably at the start of a runaway greenhouse event which will end most human life on Earth before 2040. Davies is only taking into account carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. He's not accounting for the handful of other greenhouse gases including methane, that are being emitted as a result of industrial civilization. Take a look at the figure here, and you can see that according to NOAA and NASA, the carbon dioxide levels, which did not exceed 300 parts per million for at least 650,000 years, are now at about 400 parts per million. We never had humans on a planet above 320 parts per million in the past. So right there at the knife edge with 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So far, we're only considering carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The good news about these large-scale assessments is that they do not include collapse. They don't include cessation of this set of living arrangements. And when, I'm, when I talk about collapse, what I'm thinking there is no fuel at the filling stations, no lights in the studio or elsewhere, no water coming out of the municipal taps, no food at the grocery store. So when industrial civilization reaches its overdue end and we don't have carbon being emitted to, into the atmosphere as a result of burning fossil fuels, that's collapse. The good news is none of these assessments take into account collapse. The bad news is twofold. First, when collapse comes, it triggers Fukushima meltdown times 400 and some because there are four, about 450 nuclear power plants around the world. And when all, all those melt down because nobody's minding the store anymore, that's going to present significant consequences for the human race. The bad news is that none of these major assessments take into account 
positive feedbacks or self-reinforcing feedback loops. When I say positive feedbacks, it isn't really all that positive. It's feedbacks that feed upon themselves, so they're self-reinforcing. A typical scenario is when you kick a soccer ball on a soccer field, it eventually rolls to a stop because there's friction from the grass. But if you kick a soccer ball over the hill, the further the ball goes down the hill, the faster it goes. And the faster it goes, the more difficult it is to reverse. And that's where we are with these self-reinforcing feedback loops that I'm going to present. We've kicked the ball over the hill. And the, the feedbacks are feeding upon themselves and increasing in intensity as the situation grows more dire. Taking a look at one of those positive feedbacks, Paul Beckwith, who is a graduate student and part-time professor at the University of Ottawa in Canada, concluded in, in October of 2012 that we could experience a 6C temperature rise from the current level, from about 0.85C, an additional 6C temperature rise within a decade. And Beckwith has looked at the historical data, at the, at the historical record, to reach that conclusion. He doubled down, actually more than doubled down, about a year later, and concludes we could see up to a 16C temperature increase within a decade or two. That's a huge number. Again, no humans on the planet at 3.5C above baseline in the past. And here's a legitimate climate, climate scientist talking about 6 to 16 degree temperature increase within a decade or two. When we talk about when the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases warned about rapid, unpredictable changes that could lead to extensive ecosystem damage, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about these feedbacks that reinforce, that self-reinforce. The further they go, the more dramatic, the more dire things become in terms of planetary temperature. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, one of the premier journals in the, in the history of science, has a paper that came out in October of 2012, the same time Beckwith made his original prediction that we could experience up to a 6 C temperature rise within a decade. And they point out that game theory indicates current climate negotiations won't, pre won't prevent catastrophe. Well, of course not, because there is no governmental or political response to climate change that is viable. The only response is to terminate this set of living arrangements, and I don't know a lot of people who would vote for that. I don't know a lot of people who would, who would listen to a national level politician claiming that we need to cease all emissions immediately or we're going to destroy habitat for our species and then vote for that person. I, because by definition, that person is pointing out that their job is going away, along with everybody else's jobs. From a paper in Science, in August 2013, climate change is on track to occur 10 times faster than at any time during the last 65 million years. 10 times faster than what we've seen in the last 65 million years. And included in that 65 million years, according to a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, is a 5 degree C temperature rise in the span of 13 years, all about 55 million years ago. So that's a huge number in a short period of time. It's no wonder Paul Beckwith reaches the conclusion that we could observe a 6 or 16 degree C temperature rise within a decade or two. After all, we have in the historical past a similar such event occurring in the span of 13 years. Again, from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a paper from now more than five years old, pointing out that climate change is irreversible. The paper points out that the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today is the minimum level we will observe for at least the next thousand years. We're at approximately 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We'll be at approximately 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for at least the next thousand years. There's no way to take it out at scale. United Nations Environment Program during the, 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 the most dire year of the so-called Great Recession, 2008, points out that global carbon emissions actually increased to their highest level since the Clean Air Act was fully implemented in the United States in 1980. And of course, since then, we've set a record every year for carbon dioxide emissions. 
2009 set a record over 2008, 2010 set a record over that, 2011 set a record, and so on, so that as of 2013, the year just ended, we now know that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increased to an all-time level as a result of emissions increasing to an all-time level. So even though we're in the midst of a global recession at best, or depression, depending on whether you have a job or not, we're still triggering record-setting greenhouse gas emissions every single year. It's obvious at this point that we can't merely slow down the industrial machine. We can't merely slow down industrial civilization. As Tim Garrett pointed out in a paper written seven years ago and published nearly five years ago, only collapse pre prevents runaway climate change. I suspect it's too late. But Garrett wrote the paper, and the paper was even published before any of the many self-reinforcing feedback loops I'm going to mention were published before the scientific community knew about those self-reinforcing feedback loops. So at the time, it might have appeared that, in fact, if we were to stop all industrial activity immediately, we might be able to prevent runaway greenhouse. But since then, we know that we've triggered 30-some self-reinforcing feedback loops. In addition, we now know that there's a 40-year lag between cause and consequence, between cause and effect, a 40-year lag between emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and changing the temperature of the Earth. We also know that we have generated more greenhouse gas emissions in the last 29 years than in the previous 236 years combined. None of that has had an influence on temperature yet. It's baked into the cake. It's locked in. The recipe is done. The, the oven is turned on. The cake is in the oven. We know how that's going to turn out. But none of that 29 years is yet manifest at the level of global average temperature. Only collapse prevents runaway climate change, and I strongly suspect it's too late. According to a paper in the Astrophysical Journal from right about a year ago, the Earth is not at the center of the habitable zone for a planet our size and for a sun with our intensity. In fact, it's far worse than that. For the first time ever, astrophysicists are, have, have realized that we're not in the center of the habitable zone, given a sun our size, but in fact our planet is at the inner edge of the habitable zone. And so a slight change in atmospheric chemistry will be sufficient to cause extensive warming, a greatly magnified greenhouse effect on our planet. Well, as it turns out, we haven't made a slight change in atmospheric chemistry of Earth. We've made a profound change in the atmospheric chemistry of Earth. We've increased carbon dioxide emissions from 320 parts per million at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution to about 400 parts per million today in the short span of less than 200 years. Also in that time, we've increased the amount of methane in the atmosphere from, from 700 parts per billion to nearly 2,000 parts per billion. And some stations, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, in the Arctic specifically, readings of well over 2,000 parts per billion have been recorded. Bear in mind that methane at a relatively short temporal scale is 100 times or more more powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is, molecule for molecule. And over a long period of time, say century or so, it's about 20 times more powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. So methane is a pretty big deal. And finally, as Clive Hamilton points out in his book, Earth Masters, from about a year ago, April 2013, cessation of this set of, of living arrangements increases the global average temperature by 1.1 C in a matter of days. A matter of days. So what that means is we're at 0.85 C above baseline today. Add 1.1 C to that, we're at 1.95 C. Let's call it 2. Let's round up to 2 because I suspect the, the estimate is conservative anyway. So we're right about 2 C above average if industrial civilization collapses. And if industrial civilization doesn't collapse, we're headed for 2 C, which is even according to economists will trigger several self-reinforcing feedback loops which almost nobody is taking into account that we've already triggered. So it appears that we're headed for truly dire days ahead. There's a contrarian myth in the denial community, the climate change denial community, 
that was summarily dismissed a little over a year ago with a paper in Geophysical Research Letters. It points out that not only has there not been a slowing in warming, a plateauing of warming, but in fact there's been an acceleration of warming. If we look at the figure, we can see that in fact the as of 1998, when temperatures allegedly plateaued, there was a bunch of heat going into the ocean, an exponential rise in heat going into the oceans with a bunch of that heat going into the deep ocean. So the ocean is acting like a battery in this case, storing a bunch of energy. When that energy comes out, as it will say during the next El Nino event, um, which might happen this year, might happen next year, there's going to be a, a sudden increase in global average temperature in surface measurements as well. So whereas we've seen a plateau in surface measurements, still 13 of the 14 warmest years on record have occurred since the year 2000. And so far we have data on 13 of those years. And those are 13 of the 14 warmest years in planetary history. And we haven't we haven't seen the impact of the heat that's going into the deep ocean yet, but we will. Let's take a look at a few of those self-reinforcing feedback loops that are irreversible at temporal spans relevant to the human condition. Obviously, they are reversible at very long periods of time because some of these have been triggered before and the planet has recovered and has cooled off over an extended period of time. The first of these reported in the referee journal literature is methane hydrates bubbling out of the Arctic Ocean. And there's been a lot of work done on that since that paper came out in Science in March 2010. So I'm going to give an overview of that because it appears that methane coming out of the Arctic Ocean and other locations, in fact, represents a, a pretty dire threat to habitat for, hum for humans and other organisms. So that's the first. Again, reported in March 2010, so right about four years ago. Methane in the Arctic Ocean is equivalent to between 1,000 and 10,000 gigatons of carbon. At the time, we had burned just about 220 gigatons of carbon in the, in the form of fossil fuels. Now we're up around 300, parts, 300 gigatons of carbon as a result of fossil fuels. But regardless of how you look at it, this is a big number. 1,000 to 10,000 gigatons of carbon equivalent from methane in the Arctic Ocean alone. That's not accounting for methane coming from permafrost or from Antarctica. It's just from the Arctic Ocean alone. A minor increase in temperature at the, at the planetary level, and particularly in the Arctic Ocean, is sufficient to trigger a major methane release, according to a paper in Geophysical Research Letters. Well, what do you know? Especially in the Arctic, we haven't observed a minor temperature increase. We've observed a minor temperature increase, depending on how you define minor, at the level of the globe, about 0.85 degrees C planetary average increase since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. But in the Arctic, temperatures are increasing at a much more rapid pace than that. We have triggered a suite of amplifying feedback mechanisms in the subsea Arctic Ocean. Those have been engaged, as reported in the journal Global Policy just over a year ago. So it's pretty clear that we have triggered the clathrate gun at this point, that the so-called clathrate gun James Hansen worried about in his book Storms of My Grandchildren, or the methane bomb, that we have triggered that. And, and as a consequence, a 50 gigaton, 50 gigaton burp of methane, equivalent 50 gigatons of methane coming out of the Arctic Ocean is possible at any time, according to the authors of a paper written in Nature in July of 2013. That's equivalent to more than 1,000 gigatons of carbon. Remember, so far, by burning fossil fuels, we've put about... 300 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere. So this is about three times that amount in, that's, that's highly possible at any time to enter the atmosphere. So this is a huge number and hugely catastrophic. Methane plumes have been observed up to 150 kilometers across in the Arctic Ocean by NASA's CARVE project as of last summer. 
July 2013. So those are big plumes of bubbles coming out of the Arctic Ocean, releasing methane directly into the atmosphere. Based on that feedback alone, Sam Karana, Karana predicts that methane has gone exponential and atmospheric methane will lead to 4C temperature increase by 2030 and 10C temperature increase by 2040. Those are big numbers considering that we haven't had habitat for humans on this planet at 3.5C above baseline. And what that looks like is illustrated in this figure, and you can see the runaway greenhouse effect that Karana worries about, that James Hansen worried about in Storms of My Grandchildren, as a result of the clathrate gun or the methane bomb going off, thus triggering runaway stage. And as Malcolm Light wrote in January of this year, just a couple of months ago, and I quote, the Gulf Stream transport rate started the methane hydrate clathrate gun firing in the Arctic in 2007 when its energy per year exceeded 10 million times the amount of energy per year necessary to dissociate subsea Arctic methane hydrates. So there was ample energy in the Arctic Ocean in 2007 to trigger the clathrate gun, more than ample as it turns out. Malcolm Light conducted an analysis of that methane clathrate triggering in 2012, and he wrote about it on the 9th of February 2012, writing for the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, and relying upon data from NOAA and NASA, which clearly demonstrated an exponential release of methane into the atmosphere from the Arctic Ocean. Subsequently, a handful of data points were removed from the data set. The data set was smoothed and revised so that the exponential function appeared to no longer apply. But since then, of course, we've seen the, the results from the NASA CARVE project with pl methane plumes 150 kilometers across. Since then, we have seen with fairly convincing evidence that the clathrate gun was in fact fired in 2007. And so I think we can expect an exponential increase in, t in temperature resulting from exponential release of methane in the Arctic Ocean. Light wrote in 2012 about extinction by mid-century, methane release will accelerate exponentially, and in fact, based on the evidence before it was smoothed and revised, that exponential function had already been triggered, release huge quantities of methane into the atmosphere and lead to the demise of all life on Earth before the middle of the century. Now, I don't, I don't think that's right. I don't think we can kill everything as a result of industrial civilization. That's clearly the goal, one of the goals of industrial civilization, but I don't think we're gonna get, gonna get there as early as 2047, plus or minus a few years. And, and these, these numbers did have plus or minus on them. So it was 2031 in the Northern Hemisphere, plus or minus 13 years, and 2047, in the southern hemisphere, plus or minus a similar number of years. So this is the kind of rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear response that the United Nations Environment Group, the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gas, has warned about in October of 1990. And as nearly as I can tell, few, if any, people paid any attention to that. Again, we see the exponential function of Sam Karana and a, a great quote from Al, Albert Bartlett, professor emeritus for a long time at Colorado University in Boulder. And he points out that the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. We could, we could quibble about whether that's the greatest shortcoming of the human race, but it certainly is one of them. Take a look at what that methane looks like, and we see in this figure that methane release shown here by the red and especially the dark red is occurring in the northern hemisphere. This is from just about a month ago and you can see a tremendous amount of methane being released in the Arctic and spilling down into the into the nearly the tropical region. And this is one of the two reasons why I suspect we'll run out of habitat for humans in the northern hemisphere long before we run out of habitat for humans in the southern hemisphere. In the northern hemisphere we have all this methane 
which is a profoundly important, very powerful greenhouse gas. In addition, the second reason is that the northern hemisphere is characterized by a lot of land, whereas the southern hemisphere is characterized by a lot of water. And the ocean has a tremendous ameliorating impact on temperature rise. So when you have a third of Africa, most of South America and Australia and New Zealand, and those are the only land masses in the southern hemisphere, it's easy to understand why the, the temperature rise would be slower in the southern hemisphere than in the northern, northern hemisphere. In addition, Antarctica is a big, big mass of ice that would be very difficult to melt, even at the rate we're going today. It appears that we're going to melt all of the ice in the Arctic Ocean in a relatively short period of time, in a matter of years, as opposed to a matter of decades. That will have tremendous consequences, whereas it, it requires 72 79.2 calories to convert a gram of ice to a gram of water at zero degrees C. Take a gram of ice at zero degrees C, convert it to a gram of water, a milliliter of water at zero degrees C. That takes 79.2 calories. So we have the Arctic ice mass up there absorbing a lot of the heat. Once that 79.2 calories converts that gram of ice to a gram of water, add in another 79 calories to that gram of water, that milliliter of water, and the temperature of that milliliter of water increases to 79.2 degrees. So the effect of the ice is profound. It absorbs a lot of the energy that's coming in from the sun and being trapped by the, by the so-called greenhouse effect. When you get rid of that ice, all that energy is going to be used to heat up the water and heat up the land masses, and that's going to utter, represent utter catastrophe in a very short period of time. The second of the self-reinforcing feedback loops was reported in 2011. So there was one of these reported in 2010. There were four that were reported in 2011. The first of those was Atlantic water shooting up through the Fram Strait off the north and east coast of Greenland directly into the Arctic. So warm Atlantic water is, is streaming straight up into the Arctic instead of turning south as part of the thermohaline conveyor belt or Gulf Stream. Second of those reported that year, 2011, was Siberian methane. In Siberia, there's, there were these methane vents that were about 30 centimeters across in the summer of 2010. And researchers would go out and light those on fire and make a big Roman candle to demonstrate to people the consequences of, of a warming planet. That summer 2010, those methane vents are about 30 centimeters across. Summer 2011, those methane vents were about a kilometer across. And so nobody was setting those on fire and capturing that on film. That'll take your eyebrows off. When we talk about, when the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases talks about rapid, unpredictable, nonlinear responses, this is exactly what we can expect a million-fold increase in the size of these methane vents from one summer to the next. That's a profound change. The third reported in 2011 was a drought in the Amazon that really is part of a much larger series of feedbacks. Trees that are dying stop sequestering so much carbon and instead start decomposing and kicking carbon up into the atmosphere. So that drought-induced mortality of trees that slows photosynthesis, slows photosynthesis and exacerbates decomposition has actually been reported in the Referee Journal literature since about 2000, and there were two major reviews in significant journals last year, 2013. So the Amazonian drought got a lot of attention because that's the lungs of the planet, but we've known about this one for a while. Still, I'm throwing this into the 2011 group and finally, the fourth reported in 2011 was peat decomposition, which peat in the world's boreal forest was decomposing so rapidly it was as if it was sublimating, going from solid form to vapor, to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in a very short period of time. So what we have here is it gets warmer and drier, more of that peat is exposed, therefore that peat disintegrates and kicks carbon directly into the atmosphere, making it warmer and drier. And you can see where this goes, it's a self-reinforcing feedback loop. So we have one of those self-reinforcing feedback loops reported in 2010, four in 2011. Another half a dozen, I'm not gonna go through each of them, another half a dozen reported in 2012. So one in 2010, four in 2011, 
six in 2012, and then things start to really take off. And so we have a half a dozen reported in the early portion of 2013, and then not another half a dozen, but in fact, another 16 total reported in 2013. So we had one reported in 2010, four reported in 2011, six reported in the Referee Journal literature in 2012, 16 self-reinforcing feedback loops reported in 2013, and so far, three reported in 2014. So if you're looking to tally those up, and of course I am, what that looks like to me is we had one reported in 2010, four in 2011, six in 2012, 16 in 2013, and three so far in 2014, or a total of 30 self-reinforcing feedback loops that are irreversible at temporal spans relevant to the human experience. We also have another couple that are reversible if we had the political will to pursue that, but I doubt we do. So we're going to stick right here at just the 30 irreversible at temporal spell scales relevant to humans. 30 self-reinforcing feedback loops that we've triggered. One of those points out that we will be at about 4C in 2030, about 10C in 2040, and that's just one. And it's based on, at this point, pretty significant evidence that we've triggered the class rate gun. And so it looks like we're headed for the abyss, the end of the human experience. So I know this is not a particularly optimistic approach. I'm not half full. It's not, in my opinion, it's not particularly pessimistic. In fact, I think it's incredibly liberating to have the information. I think I'm a realist. I think I'm telling it like it is. I'm reporting the information from journals and other sources indicating where the evidence is headed. I think it's very liberating because if indeed we're headed for extinction, what that tells us is it reminds us that we're mortal as individuals and it reminds us that, our, that we're mortal as a species as well. And so what that means to me is we get to express our humanity on the way out the door. We get to illustrate the best of ourselves. If we're the last, why not be the best? Now, I suspect that there will be people who will do what people have always done, grub for a little more glitter, grub for a little more gold, try to make m as much money as they possibly can while the world, world burns. But we aren't all sociopaths. We don't have to pursue that path. We can, we can bring out the best in our humanity anytime. But why not now, if indeed we have a finite number of years on the planet? And in fact, we've always known we've had a finite number of years on the planet at least since we were five or maybe 10 years old. I think, in fact, channeling Carl Sagan, that it's far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusion, however satisfying and reassuring. I think that we need to look beyond the shadows and lies of this culture, and that will make you understood by any stretch of the imagination. That will make you reviled for the most part. But it will also liberate you to pursue a life of excellence, to pursue a life that you want to lead that is rooted in who you are, rather than pursuing a life in a cube farm, in a corporate jungle uh, that is about as far from our inherent humanity as I could possibly imagine being. Thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to continued interactions with you through the day. You know, I often hear folks behind my back say, what's Dave up to now? Well, today we have a guest that's come to Bolingbroke to talk a little bit about some very important things that are going on, going on, going on this entire planet. How's that sound? And it affects everyone. But anyway, here in Bolingbroke, Illinois, we like to bring people in from faraway places and talk about what's going on on the entire planet. And today, it's Guy R. McPherson, who is a uh, genius, professional, laureate, something or other, something or other, from a university someplace in Arizona, I think it was. And so that's enough introduction, I think, 
I'd like to let Guy take over from here. Now, Guy, tell me about yourself. What is your background? Well, I think you overstated my credentials just a little, Dave. <laughs> okay. I spent 20 years as a tenured professor at the University of Arizona. Before that, I followed the conventional academic track, straight from high school to undergraduate school, graduate school to master's degree, master's, PhD, PhD to a postdoc, postdoc to a first academic job where I was in a visiting assistant professor position for about a year. And then I landed the brass ring. I grabbed the brass ring with a tenured position at the University of Arizona. And I spent 20 years there uh, before leaving uh, about five years ago. And so since then, I've been a homesteader and a writer and a public speaker. And now mostly I speak and write about climate change, catastrophic climate change, because it's pretty clear that we've triggered catastrophic climate change. And the combination of too many people on the planet, environmental decay, species we're driving to extinction, the water we're fouling and the air we're dirtying, along with climate change and nuclear catastrophe is going to take us to the, to the point of extinction as a species in the not very distant future. Um, excuse me, but... Did I bring you here for this time? You know, you got a lot of doom and gloom going on there. And here in Bolingbrook, Illinois, we always like to paint the happy smiley face on the side of the water tower. Now, hold on. Let's just start with five years ago, you left your position as a tenured professor. Is that about it? You were a professor at the University of Arizona. That's right. I was a, a full professor uh, by the time I was 40, which is pretty uncommon. Uh, so I was an overachiever. And I was at a major research university. For the last several years I was there, I'd been banned from teaching in my home department. So I was actually paid quite a bit of money to not, to not do any work. So in the end, I was teaching poetry in incarceration facilities. I'm a conservation biologist, and I'm a specialist in extinction, biology generally, speciation, extinction, conservation, how do we conserve what we have, what kinds of factors contribute to extinction of species, that sort of thing. And I became disgusted enough at the age of 49 that I left, that I, that I had the brass ring and I tossed it aside to pursue a different way of living. So that was about five years ago, actually May 1st of 2009. Okay, so I've established here now that you, you're kind of filled with some doom and gloom for the planet here, you know, uh, extinction you're talking a lot about. I think people know what extinction is. That's when uh, an individual species, or many, cease to exist on the planet, like the dinosaurs, for example. That was extinction. Now. Were you kind of upsetting the apple cart or something at the college? Is that why you kind of had to get out of there? Or uh, was, was it just a, you know what, I want to go live off the land and I, I need to, I, I, I don't know, what was it? Well, there were several reasons I left the university. I, I had several goals behind my departure. All of those goals have failed to be met. So it turns out it was a pretty significant mistake, probably the worst one in my life. So far, but I'm only 54 and just barely, so I have time, I think, to make a few more mistakes along the way. I, Wait till I, you get to the dark side of 50. <laughs> <laughs> then start assessing your life. Go ahead, I'm sorry. So, yeah, at the time I felt like I, I had to leave because I was, I was participating in an irredeemably corrupt culture. I was participating in a set of living arrangements while pointing out the dark underbelly of empire. I was living at the apex of empire in a city in the southwestern United States, in the interior southwestern United States, really is the apex of empire. In Tucson, all the water is transported from more than 300 miles away, uphill, across the desert. All the food comes from far away, all the fossil fuels required to heat and cool individual houses comes from far away. So when you, when you add up all the water and all the food and all the uh, all the means of maintaining your body temperature, all that comes from a really long ways away. What does that mean? That means the same thing grid-tied electricity means. It means men with guns. It means the world's largest, most effective military to extract 
everything that we think we deserve so that we, we can maintain the set of living arrangements. And so I felt like I couldn't really stay there any longer, and I had to pursue a, a different path. Now I recognize that it was a mistake because I had all these goals behind leaving, such as educating the world about living differently, such as an act of resistance against the empire. And the empire didn't notice, and neither did the people in it. And so on, all those goals have failed, have failed to be met. So I made that decision six and a half years ago, and... And, and left the university five years ago. And, and now, in retrospect, it's pretty obvious that those were catastrophic mistakes. Um, they seemed like, seemed like a good idea at the time, but we've heard that line before. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I, I, di I didn't want to participate in an, in an imperial set of living arrangements while teaching that it was a horrible thing to do. So at some level, I felt obligated to walk the talk. I'd been talking, I'd been teaching about the horrors of empire in my classes, and yet I was facing, I was looking at that face in the mirror and and living just like everybody else was, you know, accumulating the low low hanging fruit of empire. And after a while, the face in the mirror starts to not look so attractive anymore. Now I'm sure you will argue that my face never did look all that attractive. But we're not going to go there, are we? I'm not like that. I, I, I really don't judge people by the way they look. I, I try not to, at least. I mean, it's one of my goals. But it sounds to me like you were, you were uh, in the midst of some serious cognitive dissonance. And, uh, you know, for those of you people at home that don't know what cognitive dissonance is, it's a term used when things are going on around you that aren't right. And you don't realize, but you keep doing these things. And somewhere in the back of your head, you, you suddenly realize something, almost like having an epiphany. But you don't necessarily have that with cognitive dissonance. But your life can be very unsatisfying. OK, so um, you're yeah, right. That, that's right. So, so I was compartmentalizing my life, really. I, I was acting this one way in the classroom, but acting a different way outside the classroom. And so there was this cognitive dissonance. There was this compartmentalization going on where I was, I was teaching of the horrors of the way we live so that we can accumulate money and live comfortably in an empire. And at the same time, I was living just like that. I, ha I, ha I hadn't walked the talk. So, so uh, you know... The terminology, practice what you preach, folks, comes into play here that you were thinking to yourself, wait a minute, looking at yourself in the mirror in the morning, thinking like, oh my gosh, what am I, what am I doing, in other words? And so, all right, whether or not you feel that you made the right decision, to me, is inconsequential because I think you made the right decision because if you hadn't done that, you wouldn't be here right now and also all over the internet talking about these issues we face. And I, I have to really stress to you people out there in TV land and wherever you're watching that these are serious issues. All kidding aside by me, your friendly host, Dave, um, Guy McPherson is talking about the end of humanity. Extinction includes humanity. Is this correct? Yes, it is. We're in the midst of the sixth great extinction event. So we've had five. We've had five what they call great extinction events. And how do we know that? Um, we look at the historical record and, and see that over relatively short periods of time, an enormous number of species, an enormous number of taxa, species, genera, families, disappear from the fossil much, record, oh, you would time. say, yes, right? Yes, is, from, is, the, from where, the fossil record. Where you get to that line 65 million years ago, and then suddenly there's no more dinosaurs past that, right. that little piece. Right. And, right. and so there's been five extinctions that we are capable of deciphering from this fossil record. Five really big ones have been at least 16 less significant ones okay. that we detect in the fossil record. The big one was about 251 million years ago. It was called the Great Dying. And more than 90% of the species disappeared from the planet Ooh. in over, over a span of a relatively short period of time, geologically a blink of an eye. 
And, and the current extinction event is proceeding much more rapidly than that one was. So uh, we're in the midst, we would say, of the sixth. When do you think this began as far as the sixth great extinction? Would this be, you know, with the advent of, of agriculture and modern civilization, say, a couple thousand years ago, or would it be before that? No, it was, it was a few thousand years ago. When, when we came out of the Pleistocene into the Holocene some 10 or 12,000 years ago. When the glaciers, when the Ice Age ended. Right, when okay. the Ice Age ended, okay. then that set us up. I don't think many people would trace this extinction event to that period, to the, to the receding of the glaciers. But what that did was trigger a stable and warmer climate than experienced in the past. And so what that allowed us to do was to grow grains for the first time. And so in a, in a very short period of time, a few thousand years ago, somewhere between 5,000 and 8,000 years ago, we began growing grains at scale on several, in several places at once around the, around the world, which suggests to me that that temperature rise coming out of the Pleistocene made for a climate in which we could grow grains. And so once we did that, we started, we started, we went into human population overshoot in, in a very short period of time. And that's when we, the great extinction event really started. Because now there's human beings extracting all this photosynthesis and all this material produced by photosynthesis that otherwise was available to a bunch of other species as well. Now we're taking it all. We're taking way more than our share in a relatively short period of time that really ratcheted up with the beginning of the Industrial Age. First when we started with the steam engine, then when we started burning coal, and finally when we started extracting oil and delivering it at scale. So things got really, really dire um, um, about 1860 or so when we started The writing was on scale. the wall by about 1860. That's right. Now, you know, you mentioned in your book that there was even a, uh, a scientist from the time or a naturalist that did measure carbon. And uh, now who... Did, George Perkins Marsh in 1847 gave a speech, I believe it was in New Hampshire or somewhere in New England. And, and he was a naturalist. And he was also a U.S. ambassador. You never hear that combination anymore. Right now, all ambassadors are attorneys, or they come, they're CEOs, or whatever. So I he was a naturalist. We should go back and try right. some of that. Wouldn't stuff, that be awesome? You know? So here we had a guy who was well versed in the natural world. He was a naturalist. He studied the natural world, and he he foresaw the urban heat island effect, by which if you build a bunch of buildings, it's it stays warmer overnight there because of re radiation from the asphalt and the concrete, and he also foresaw global average temperature increase if we burn fossil fuels. That was in 1847. 1847. But I mean, of course, back then, you know, what was there? Maybe a billion people on the planet. Was it about one or maybe two? I don't know what it was. I, I believe there were fewer than that. Okay, so it, let's just, just say... Let's say a billion. About a billion yeah. people. And most people were pretty well spread out. So we had this uh, conception of the world kind of being endless. Mm -hmm. That's right. In, in a way, because uh, in 1850 or whatever, the United States still had plenty of virgin timber all over the place, and as far as the eye could see. Now, um, uh, okay, I, I don't know where to go with it from here.